comes to us tonight as the official introducer of Phil Levine, may I introduce to you David Hurst, my old neighbor. Okay, um, I'm an English instructor, so bear with me while I attempt uh, to construct a metaphor. <laughs> this evening, uh, we sit at the verge of the great San Joaquin River, which drains the state's largest watershed. And this river, winding through a veritable desert, supports an unparalleled abundance and variety of life that would not otherwise exist. In fact, John Wesley Powell said that a watershed is a system in which all living things are inextricably linked by their common water course, and where, as humans settled, simple logic demanded that they become part of a community. Uh, but we're here to celebrate a watershed of a different sort. While our valley is particularly fertile with both wild and cultivated life, it is also fertile with poetry. When Fresno State hired Phil Levine in 1958, little did it know that it had tapped into a font of creativity and passion that would nourish an extraordinary diversity of poetic voice and talent under what some might suggest are among the most inhospitable of circumstances. And yet it thrives. <laughs> the poetry here rises from the earth. It sends stalks like fennel through cracks in the sidewalk. It's in the field with clover and chamomile and dandelion. It's squirrels and killdeer and horses and dogs and people. Phil Levine has encouraged and challenged generations of poets. He attracted a team and successive teams of dedicated poet educators and mentors, Robert Mizzi, Chuck Hanslicek, Peter Everwine, and many more, all the way down to my own mentor, Connie Hales. Such poets as Larry Levis, David St. John, Gary Soto, Roberta Spear, and many more emerged from this bowl. I can't spot a sparrow without thinking of Ernesto Trejo. I can't walk through downtown Fresno without sighting Andres Montoya. I can't drive past Casa de Fruta without leaves of Chuck Bolton's poetry floating past on the wind. And as with any list, I've omitted here the names of more poets than I have included, and I've purposely named them before I mention Phil's own accomplishments, which I'll get to in a minute. He has two National Book Awards, two National Book Critics Circle Awards, an American Book Award. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1995. He was named the 18th U.S. Poet Laureate in 2011, and last year received the Wallace Stevens Award for outstanding and proven mastery in the art of poetry from the Academy of American Poets. And again, I'm omitting a whole host of prizes, fellowships, and awards. And, and these accolades tell us uh, of Phil's stature and renown, um, but I don't think they quite measure his influence on the life of poetry here. He's often cited as the poet of the working class, of the unsung and the unknown in our nation's fields and factories, as Bill Moyer's website puts it. The New York Times, said that uh, Phil Levine remains a distinctly urban poet. And you know, who am I to question the New York Times? But certainly Phil's working class urban roots are evidenced in his work, but I think there is just as much evidence of our valley in Phil's work. He is our watershed who gives life to our poetry. In Keats in California, in our valley, and in countless other poems, even the urban ones, I hear this world. I hear the absolution of nature. I hear its power to resist and outlast all depredation. Consider these lines from Meg Piety. Your breath slows and you know you're back in central California on your way to San Francisco or the coastal towns with their damp sea breezes you haven't even a hint of. But first you must cross the Pacheco Pass. People expect you and yet you remain still leaning forward into the grasses, that if you could hear them, would tell you all you need to know about the life ahead. I suggest words like these and the words of the community of all the poets he has influenced here, inextricably linked, 
is all the simple logic we need to understand the depth and expanse of the watershed that Phil Levine has provided us. Let's celebrate it. Please welcome Phil Levine. I'm sure you'd rather have it here than hold it. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> I'd rather have it in my living room. <laughs> I arrived here at a quarter after five, and, and I was in good voice. <laughs> but the gift of my home, this valley, is a terrible cough. So if you probably heard me back there. Did you hear me coughing? No. No? You thought, you thought it was a motorcycle. It was me. <laughs> yeah. So if, if I screw something up, you will forgive me. <laughs> or you won't. <laughs> Big deal. Uh, <laughs> see, I'm, see. Uh, rivers, rivers. I wanted to read a poem. I grew up in a city with a river, Detroit, the Detroit River. I loved it. It was a marvelous river. As a boy, I, I could take a bus and go all the way right down to the river and see, the, see these boats going in and out. And it was a kind of marvelous drama. Wondering where the hell they were going, where they'd come from. And especially a little later when I was in my teens during World War II. And the ships were coming from all over the world, from Russia, or Soviet Union, and uh, in Britain especially. And in downtown Fresno, there they would be, the sailors from all the different countries, looking for culture. You'd see them mainly in the public library. <laughs> <laughs> and occasionally in the bars. Where, where they, and of course, there, were, there was an enormous number of unattached women. You think, I'm describing paradise, actually, uh, because the men had been drafted, and the women were working, and they had, they had money. And I watched. I was too young. Well, not always. <laughs> okay, I want to read a poem, which I sent this to a musician, Ben Boone, now he wants to know what it was about. <sighs> yeah, you get asked that question hundreds of times. It's about the words that are in it. Uh, I don't ask him about his melodies, you know. <laughs> I just accept them for what they are. Or don't like them. The rivers are Spanish. An American poet named Robert Francis, who you may never have heard of, uh, when he died, he was older than I am now. He's about 130. Uh, <laughs> he wrote a magnificent poem, which was a kind of hymn to American rivers. So that was taken. So I thought I would put in Spanish rivers. I, my wife and my kids and I all uh, together, we all lived in Spain for a couple of years. Was, we went to uh, Franco, Spain to escape Reagan's California. <laughs> it was like, there was no difference <laughs> in the rumors. I mean, of course, there were profound difference. It's called by the waters of the Llobregat. The Llobregat is a, the word itself is Catalan, and it's a river that uh, enters the sea oh, maybe 10, 15 miles south of Barcelona, where we were living, by the waters of the Llobregat. Two women and a small girl, perhaps three or four years old, resting in the shade of the fir trees. From far off the roar of the world, coming back one more time. First a few words tossed back and forth, between awakening men and then machines, talking them to themselves in the language they share with the heavenly bodies, planets, dust motes, distant solar systems, 
that know what needs to be done and do it. So long ago, you think, those days. So unlike these, blessed by favorable winds and forgotten in the anthems we hummed on the long walk home from work with the childish fables we tried to believe. No one notices the small girl and her caretakers are gone. And no one huddles in the shade of the fir trees. The air, brilliant and calm, stays to witness. The single cloud lost between heaven and here stays. The mountains look down and keep their distance. Somewhere far off, the sea goes on working for itself. By the waters of the Obregat, no one sits down to weep for the children of the world. By the Ebro, the Tagus, the Guadalquivir, by the waters of the world, no one sits down and weeps. I can find something slightly more cheerful. <laughs> this poem is essentially about time and the creatures that live in it, <laughs> like you and me. Uh, and I suppose I wrote it because I'm old. Uh, in case you hadn't noticed, I'm quite old. Very old, actually. And I hope to get even older. <laughs> Ten years from now, I'll be reading to you again. Right. And I hate to say this, all of you will look worse. <laughs> okay. There's <laughs> so a lot. It's called the future. The past is no more past than the future. Or so said Meridian, the unlikely seer of my senior shop class. I'll call him John. Although he was never a John or even a Juan or a Jack. Although his surname, Meridian, ended with I-A-N, which is Ian in Cornwall, the Celtic version of John. Our John. John Moradian, gone 67 years ago from our schoolboy class into the wider world of war, where his one-way ticket got punched just the once. I, I would start this again if I could. Start quietly with a Dougie or an Allen, both of whom made it into their 30s, though neither ever spoke of the past being anything but over with. What they actually thought, I'll never know. One spring day, the whole class went by bus to the foundry at Ford Rouge to see earth melted and poured like syrup into fire. Look up, someone said. Maybe Dougie or Alan. So I did and saw way up above the collisions of metal and men a family of sparrows in the trapped light, trapped themselves or perhaps out to reclaim their stolen space. Speaking of perhaps, perhaps I'm dawdling because I haven't seen John or Alan or Dougie in over 50 years. Perhaps I just like repeating their names as though that could help them or perhaps help me. And it does. It helps me. They're beyond my help. Later, the class picnicked on egg salad beside a wide stream that fed our filthy river. Alan, or maybe it was Dougie, managed to cross the water leaping from rock to rock and then back again. His balance was that good. Alan, or maybe Dougie, whoever had crossed dared me to cross but I knew enough not to try. I remember the sky darkening in the east, the bus arriving with the rain, 
the windows steaming up to hide the flooded streets. I remember I sat next to Alan, who lied a blue streak about an older girl who owned her own car. The bus driver lost the way and had to stop at a filling station in Del Rey to get directions. So the trip was endless. I got back before nightfall, but the day kept going on and on into the present. <laughs> Pennsylvania Pastoral. The car stops, not because the driver decided they'd gone far enough, or because the woman said I'm sick or the boy had to pee. It simply stopped because it had to. And when the three got out and he pops the hood they discover the fan belt has vanished and the engine shut down wisely. It could be worse. It could always be worse. A cylinder could seize for no foreseeable reason and send them into irreversible debt. Cars are, after all, only machines. And this one, a 48 Pontiac 6, is aged and whimsical. It could be much worse. The Mojave in mid-July with no shade in sight. Or northern Ontario in winter, the snow already burning the backs of father's hands and freighting mother's lashes. They've stalled descending into a gully in rural Pennsylvania. A quiet place of maples leafing out. A place with its own creek, high in its banks, and beyond the creek, a filling station. It's lights still on after dawn, the red and green pumps ready to give, and someone there, half awake. <laughs> read a Fresno poem. So Fresno, with your filthy air and delicious river, forgive me. It's called Arrival. If the express should slow and then suddenly stop and sit utterly still for minutes on end, and all talk stop, and no one question the stillness, no voice announce what, if anything, is about to transpire. A hard word that for me, transpire, out of Latin, to go out, to go out into breath or air, or nothing. And only I grow restive, the dozen or so others drowsing or seemingly at peace, while the prophet on crutches at last shuts his Bible in his mouth, so that when I rise to stand, the train lurches forward to regain its momentum, and at last arrives somewhere, a station on no map I know, and I make my way upward through the littered passageways to where the street waits with no one to welcome me. I'll know I'm home. These are, all, these are all sort of recent poems. Later on, I will read older poems. You'll see how much you found out. It's, it's a strange poem. It's somewhat autobiographical, but only somewhat. I don't really write autobiographical poems uh, because I find, for the most part, my life has been pretty dull. Uh, you know, I, I sit in a room, I try to write poems, I fail. The next day I sit in a room, I try to write poems, I fail. And then I dream up excuses for not sitting there and failing. And then I feel guilty and go back into the room and fail. And then I get a poem. And I'm thrilled. And the minute I write it, there's a knock at the door. And it's either someone like Wallace Stevens or T.S. Eliot coming to congratulate me, <laughs> or a herd of, of women. I hear you wrote a great poem. May I embrace you? <laughs> so it's not as dull as I suggested. You know, especially when Stevens comes, because he offers me a cigar. 
called Moonshine. And it, and it, it is somewhat autobiographical. <clears throat> the people in it, people I knew, Moonshine. At 19, I wanted to write the epic of the moon. It's rising in the east at dawn. I wanted to capture the faces of the assemblers as they trudged across the snow-lit parking lot behind Detroit Transmission at 8 a.m. After a Friday shift, knowing the weekend was theirs, the first weekend in the world's sorry history without a moment of sunlight. I wanted to catch their voices, their hot damning, their ain't this some shit, their pure poetry. No surprise, the epic never got written. Dawn came, the sun rose, rain pounded what was left of the blackened snow, and I took the bus home, had a cup of thick barley soup I'd made myself, slept and rose to spend my day reading Rilke in a stilted translation and wondered what the fuss was all about. As for the night, there was a moon, it came, it did its time, it went. Whether it was paid by the hour or the month, I never knew. In 1949, all the workers were poets, though not a single one suspected it. Eddie Dompke, was more eloquent than the melting snow or the corolla of stars blinking above the bus stop. To hear Eddie speak in his tobacco-stained baritone of the perfect tits he'd squeezed, to hear him swear by all the saints, was to revel in the glory of imagined things, to know the beauty of a world that never was. These books are hope, these poems that I've read are hopefully all headed for a magnificent prize winning book. Uh, I shall dig up an already published book. Ah, uh, yeah. They said there would be a book signing, and if you brought books, I will sign them. And if you didn't, I would certainly forgive you. Because I don't buy books either. I wait for the authors to send them to me, and they rarely do. So I read old books over and over. Today I was reading, what the hell's the name of it? It's a book by Charles Baxter. I read a book of his stories the other day, an early book. I don't know if you know Charles Baxter as an American fiction writer from the generation younger than I, maybe two generations younger, now that Philip Roth has stopped writing. He was successful. Right, Phil? Yeah. This is called Our Valley. I don't have to explain anything to you. Nothing. I talk about living by the sea, that was in Spain, years ago, 1965. Our valley. We don't see the ocean, not ever. But in July and August, when the worst heat seems to rise from the hard clay of this valley, you could be walking through a fig orchard when suddenly the wind cools, and for a moment you get a whiff of salt and in that moment, you almost believe something is waiting beyond the Pacheco Pass. Something massive, irrational, and so powerful, even the mountains that rise east of here have no word for it. You're probably, you probably think I'm nuts saying the mountains have no word for ocean. But if you live here, you begin to believe they know everything. They maintain that huge silence we think of as divine. A silence that grows in autumn when snow falls slowly between the pines and the wind dies to less than a whisper 
and you can barely catch your breath because you're thrilled and terrified. You have to remember, this isn't your land. It belongs to no one. Like the sea you once lived beside and thought was yours. Remember the small boats that bobbed out as the waves rode in and the men who carved a living, a living from it only to find themselves carved down to nothing? Now you say, this is home. So go ahead, worship the mountains as they dissolve in dust. Wait on the wind. Catch a scent of salt. Call it our life. In this, this, this book is called the News of the World. It's my most recent. Uh, 2009, I think. I think. Not that long ago. I mean, you know, I'm still working. Yeah, 2009. That's only five years. Rilke took forever to write his poems. And it took me forever to read them. Some of them are very good. Those mean remarks I made about his poems were really not my attitude. I adore all poems and all poets, except the ones I don't care for. <laughs> <clears throat> this is called The Language Problem. <clears throat> Which is what, of course, you deal with if you're writing. Yeah, you, you deal with the problem of its intractability, its stubbornness, its refusal to give in to your begging. Come on, language, make this sound better. And the language sits there and says, oh, go ahead, see if you can do it. You know? we, Willie could do it, why can't you? That was hundreds of years ago. Hasn't there been any progress? And the answer is no. There, hasn't. there is no progress in the arts, there's only change and fashion, the language problem. Cuban, Spanish, this is a prose poem, by the way. If you, if you were to look at it, you would see it's a, it's a kind of ugly block, which is what prose writers do. You know, they fill up the page and <clears throat> belittle you with all their words. <clears throat> That's why I don't write novels like Philip Roth's that in the fact I have no talent for it. <laughs> the language problem. Cuban Spanish is incomprehensible, even to Cubans. If you spit in his face, he'll tell you it's raining, the cab driver said. In Cuban, it means your cigar is from Tampa. Single, desperate, almost 40, my ex-wife told the Cuban doctor she'd give a million dollars for a perfect fair pair of breasts. God hates a coward, he said, and directed her to an orthopedic shoe store <laughs> where everything smelled like iodine. A full-page ad on the back of Nueva Prensa Cubana clearly read, quote, free rum 24 hours a day and more on weekends. Free rum was in italics. When I showed up that evening at the right address, Calle Bispo 28, the little merchant I spoke to said, rum? This is not a distillery. They were flogging Venetian blue umbrellas for $4 American. Mine was made in Taiwan, and when it rained, refused to open. Before sunset, the streets filled with music. In the great plaza of the revolution, the dark came slowly, filled with the perfume of automobile exhaust and wisteria. I danced with a girl from Santiago de Cuba. Gabriela Mistral Garcia was her name. She was taller than I. 
and wore her black hair in a wiry tangle. She was a year from her doctorate in critical theory. After our dance, she grabbed me powerfully by the shoulders as a comandante in a movie might, leaned down as though to kiss me on the cheek and whispered in my good ear, I dream of tenure. <laughs> it was the 50s all over again. That poem actually comes out of coming to Fresno State. The first couple of years I was here, tenure was not a word I really knew. I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't, I had, I had been a sort of adjunct at the University of Iowa for a couple of years teaching technical writing. Nobody ever mentioned tenure. And when I came here, it was a kind of ballad, the ballad of tenure. Tenure, 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 tenure. It was a word that kept coming at me. And people would say, he didn't get tenure. You know, it's like as though he'd been emasculated. Just ruined forever. Or, She'll do anything to get tenure. I mean, I thought, this is madness. You know, in this dump. <laughs> It's not a bad school now, but it was not particularly good then. I mean, it was fine for me. I'd gone to a mediocre school, Wayne University of Detroit, but which was perfect for me. All the teachers were communists. I loved it. So I felt very cozy here. And my students reminded me of the people I'd grown up with, working class. All right, now I'm going to get serious. You'll forgive me. This is called Innocence. There's a man in it who takes a walk. He's a German novelist. Oh, God, I can't even remember his name. It's not important. He wrote a book called something or other. Uh, <laughs> the Moons of Saturn. It's a fabulous book. Anyway, in the book he describes a walking trip in East Anglia, which happened to be where my older brother was stationed when he was in the, uh, the American Air Force in World War II. Uh, and, and in the book, there's much discussion of World War II. It was an obsession with this, this man. Uh, he's a terrific writer. And I recommend the, the rings or the moons of Saturn. A buzz bomb. These were first rocket bombs that were launched from France and dropped on London. This was in about 1943 and 4. Uh, he goes... Uh, there's a mention of a Neutra house. Richard Neutra was a Viennese architect whose wife was Jewish, so in the 30s they left Vienna and he settled in LA and he built these marvelous houses. Neutra, N E U T R A. You can find, you know, there are books on these houses and they're, they're metal and glass and they're very Bauhaus wonders. I wouldn't want to live in one because it's like living in, you know, living in public. It's all this glass. But, but they're beautiful. Uh, what else? What else? Okay. The Luftwaffe. Young people might not know. That's the word for the German Air Force in World War II. East Anglia is uh, an area on the North Sea, maybe a hundred miles north of, of London, but right on the sea. Innocence. Smiling, <clears throat> my brother straddles a beer keg outside a pub. 1944, a year of buzz bombs. He's in the Air Corps on a mission to London to refill oxygen tanks. 
for B-24s, the flying coffins as they were dubbed by those who flew them night after night. Fifty years later, <clears throat> a German writer on a walking trip through East Anglia meets a gardener who recalls as a boy of 12 hearing the planes taking off at dusk to level the industrial cities of the Ruhr. And later, when the Luftwaffe was all but destroyed, whatever they could reach. 50,000 American lads died, the gardener says, and recalls waking near dawn, the planes stuttering back in twos and threes. How many Germans died, we may never know. Must have been women and children, and the very old, what with all the eligible men gone to war, he says. The German novelist writes it down word for word in his mind, and goes on to an appointment with an English writer, born in Germany, a Jew, who got out in time. My brother recalls a young woman who lived above the pub, a blonde, snapping the picture outside the pub with his own Argus C3, and points out a horse and wagon around the corner loaded with beer kegs, but with no driver. The pub is closed, for it is not long after dawn and the city is rising for work and war. We call the time innocent, for lack of a better word. We call all the Germans the Nazis because it suits the vengeance we exact. Some hours later, the two writers born in Germany sit out in a summer garden and converse in their adopted language and say nothing about what they can't forget as children. For these two remain children until they die. My brother, blind now, tells me he is glad to be alive. He calls every painful day a gift. He's not sure he earned, but accepts with joy. He lives in a Neutra house with entire walls of glass and a view of the Pacific, a house he bought for a song 20 years ago in disrepair. He accepts the fact that each year squadrons of architectural students from Europe and Asia drop in to view the place. And though he cannot see, he shows them around graciously and lets them take their photographs. When I tell him of the 50,000 airmen the gardener told the novelist about, his blind eyes tear up. For above all, my older brother is a man of feeling and his memory is precise, like a diamond. And he says, not that many. Here's another Fresno poem. And this is a rather personal poem. Uh, I lived in the same house, geez, I don't know what the house was, 1972, it's not all that long, but I've grown accustomed to it, I love it, uh, it's where I wrote my best poems, so then people ask me, in Brooklyn people say, why do you come back to Fresno, why do you go back there? And people in Fresno say, why do you go to Brooklyn? <laughs> I like it. One of the things is they have nothing in common, in spite of what I said, you know, they have nothing. Brooklyn is a city where you walk. I don't have a car there, so you walk, you walk, you meet people. Hi. The difference in the gyms are incredible. People come up to me and say, you know, I saw your poem in the New Yorker, and I was very surprised by the fact that you're writing in trochaic tetrameter. And then, thank you. Yeah, well, how come? Mm -hmm. Here they come up and they say, you have even 
smaller muscles than you had last year. <laughs> you, you, need to, you need to get a good protein drink. <laughs> you stop doing those sit-ups. Yeah. It's a real difference. <clears throat> Called burial rites. Even on a rare morning of rain like this morning, with the low sky hoarding its riches except for a few mock tears. The hard ground accepts nothing. Six years ago, I buried my mother's ashes beside a young lilac that's now taller than I and stuck the stub of a rose bush into her dirt where, like everything else not human, it thrives. The small blossoms never unfurl. Whatever they know, they keep to themselves until a morning rain or a night wind pairs the petals down to nothing. Even the neighbor cat who shits daily on the paths and then hides deep in the jungle of the weeds refuses to purr. It's right to end up beside the woman who bore me, to shovel into the dirt whatever's left and leave only a name for someone who wants it. Think of it, my name, no longer a portion of me, no longer inflated or bruised, no longer stewing in a rich compost of memory or the simpler one of bone, kitty litter, the roots of the eucalyptus I planted back in 73, a tiny me, taking nothing, giving nothing, empty and free at last. Actually, I, I didn't bring gin tonight, though it would have worked. I found in the last couple of days that a little drink at a certain moment, whoops, my Kleenex is falling, that would render me helpless, uh, that a little, little alcohol in the uh, sort of relaxes that cough. I was sitting up there while Steve was playing and admiring his technique, and sipping, sipping a certain amount of alcohol. Sipping, I could do it again right now if you'd like to see it. I brought it in a bottle disguised as urine. <laughs> this book is falling apart. You know, for the simple reason it was never bound. This book is dedicated to Larry Levis and my marvelous friend and student who died far too young. And uh, uh, Jin is in here somewhere, and I will find it. And it's inscribed to Larry. And I was going to send it to him. This is our mock-up book. But before I could mail it off, because I'm very, very irresponsible about things like that. Uh, I got the, the real book with, uh, with a binding and a nice hard cover. So Larry got the real book and I kept this, which someday will be worth seven, eight dollars. <laughs> Is it signed? <laughs> All right, Jim, where the hell are you, Jim? Okay. Oh, God, this is going to be... Well, I'll do it. Because, because you asked for it. There used to be something on the radio, it, because you asked for it. You know, we are going to kill three sheep here on, the <laughs> on television, so, because you asked for it. You know that kind of request shows. Uh, uh, I never saw them kill the sheep. I turned it off. I made that up. <laughs> gin. The first time I drank gin, I thought it must be hair tonic. My brother swiped the bottle from a guy whose father owned a drugstore that sold booze in those ancient, honorable days when we acknowledged the stuff was a drug. Three of us passed the bottle around, each tasting with disbelief. 
People paid for this? People had to have it the way we had to have the women we never got near? Actually, they were girls, but never mind. The important fact was their impenetrability. Leo, the third foolish partner, suggested my brother should have swiped Canadian whiskey or brandy. But Eddie defended his choice on the grounds of the expressions Gin House and Gin Lane, both of which indicated the preeminence of gin in the world of drinking, a world we were entering without understanding how difficult exit might be. Maybe the bliss that came with drinking came only after a certain period of apprenticeship. Eddie likened it to the holy men's self-flagellation to experience the fullness of faith. He was very well read for a kid of 14 in the public school. So we dug in and passed the bottle around a second time and then a third in the silence each of us expecting some transformation. You get used to it, Leo said. You don't like it, but you get used to it. I know now that brain cells were dying for no earthly purpose. <laughs> that three boys were becoming increasingly despiritualized, even as they took into themselves these spirits. But I thought then, I was at last sharing the world with the movie stars. That before long I would be shaving because I needed to. That hair would sprout across the flat prairie of my chest and plunge even to my groin. That first girls and then women would be drawn to my qualities. Amazingly, later, some of this took place. <laughs> but first the bottle had to be empty. And then the three boys had to empty themselves of all they had so painfully taken in. And by means even more painful, as they bowed by turns over the eye of the toilet bowl to discharge their shame. Ahead lay cigarettes, the futility of guaranteed programs of exercise, the elaborate lies of conquest no one believed. Forms of sexual torture and rejection undreamed of. Ahead lay our 15th birthdays. Acne, deodorants, crabs, salves, butch haircuts, draft registration, the military and political victories of Dwight Eisenhower, who brought us Richard Nixon with wife and dog. Any wonder we tried gin? <laughs> Thank you. Well, that was a treat, wasn't it? Fill the beans. We're glad to come back to Fresno now and then.